Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Lauren Smith with the International Franchise Association, and we have a great 60 minutes lined up for you. Before we, we begin, I would like to remind everyone that today's session is being recorded and will be made available later this evening on community.franchise.org. If you have any questions for today's speakers, please drop them in the questions box for our speakers to address toward the end. Today's topic is cybersecurity risk in the franchise industry. Don't wait until it's too late. Here to provide today's discussion is Sarah Pavlik and Scott M. Patry. Thank you so much, Sarah and Scott, and thank you to Plant Moran for sponsoring today's webinar. I'll go ahead and turn things over to you. Thank you. Um, my name is Sarah and I have been with Plant Moran for a little bit over 21 years. I'm excited to be talking to you today. I spend my time in our cyber practice, um, working with organizations on helping them with cyber compliance um, and cybersecurity risk assessments. Yep, and good afternoon. I'm Scott Petrie. Uh, similar to Sarah, started uh, way back when the Y2K crisis wasn't really a big deal, but uh, uh, help our clients in our cybersecurity compliance areas as well as uh, some testing and assessment. Perfect. And with that, we will get started. So one of the first things that we wanted to chat about is what makes the franchise industry a cyber target? Um, so typically in um, the franchise organizations, there's a large number of locations that can lead to a lot of interdep interdependent and interconnected systems. And what this creates is an increase in the amount of attack points um, for those um, hackers and malicious actors. Um, another reason is there's oftentimes confusion over responsibility. So not knowing whether the franchisor or the franchisee is responsible for cyber protections um, can create holes in systems. And if the responsible party is defined, so let's say that's in a contract um, or a service agreement, how um, are you making one another accountable for ensuring those appropriate cyber controls are in place? Uh, the last piece is attackers know that franchises have a lot of data, a lot of customer data, including access to credit card information. So thinking about what the impact is, um, you know, one of the things that we're that we see is that you know, based on data breaches that have occurred in the last year or even you know a couple of years, we see the continued cost of data breach continue to go up. Um, so projected uh, costs from last year to this, you know, from the, the previous year was about 10%. And these are really just uh, data breaches that have been reported. Um, so really, if you think about those that, are, that aren't known or the ones that haven't been reported uh, and in the news just yet is uh, you could consider that to be, even be anywhere from two times or even you know, two and a half times more uh, than the cost of what, what the prior years were from a, a data breach perspective. Um, the other, next slide. The other, the other area is really just thinking about brand reputation and the financial impact uh, on a on an organization when a breach occurs. You know, one thing that we think about is um, the number of records that that maybe you have access to, whether they're your customers, your employees, or other financial information. Uh, typically, the the cost per record is is anywhere from 170 to 180 dollars. Um, you know, this, this really represents that identity theft protection uh, on an annual basis. And that could just be the, the initial starting point. And then when, when you also include in there the loss of the, the uh, financial impact could be uh, quite a lot more, um, you know, and that's where you could really rack up those uh, large, large breach costs, as well as impacting your, your overall reputation. So what can you do? Um, you know, some of the things that we really want to talk about today is, is in the area of assessing your risk um, and making sure that you understand where those risks are, looking at where, where are your data points, and then what systems might be impacted. Uh, that, that really starts with a risk assessment. Um, the other area to consider is, um, is in the area of incident response. So this is that concept where it's not a matter of if it's going to happen, it's a matter of when it, when it can occur. Uh, from a breach perspective, and then what are you in your organization, um, you know, what's your response effort look like, and are you prepared to be able to quickly respond uh, to a, a data breach or a data event that, that, that occurs, or a cyber event rather, that occurs, and can you quickly ramp up to be able to stop 
uh, those those efforts and then ultimately try to respond and recover from them. Um, and then the other thing that we want to talk about is uh, you know, after you do a risk assessment, you're looking at your incident response. You also want to consider the controls that you have in place um, and then thinking through some of the new requirements that PCI, uh, the payment card industry, has put out in, in the newest version uh, 4.0. Um, we'll talk through a little bit of those controls. Uh, things to look for, as well as um, how to you know, how to really address some of those those, those risk elements from the controls perspective. So the first element that Scott talked about um, was this risk assessment piece. So a risk assessment is really intended to help you uncover threats um, and develop solutions to protect your organization. The goal is really to try to figure out how well you're protected and to define an action plan for areas where you might need to do more. Typically, what we like to see is that key members of the C-suite and subject matter experts from IT um, or those um, within the organization being involved in that process. Um, the, another thing to consider too is it's, it's important to understand the cost of the controls in place versus the cost of not being prepared or protected. Um, oftentimes, you know, when a breach occurs, that expense is going to be far greater than what it would have cost to put preventative and detective controls in place in the first place. Um, it, it, it's an important exercise to make sure that you're spending money in the right places. So uh, I think most organizations want to spend their money smartly. Um, so you, you don't want to spend all the money in an area of low risk um, and not, not protect yourselves in an area of higher risk. Um, so those are really the goals of um, performing a risk assessment and why it's important to do so. So from you know, an, an action plan perspective, the first piece to the risk assessment is trying to figure out what data you wanna protect. Um, is it credit card information? Is it customer data? Is it employee data? Is it statistical data in terms of buying patterns, um, you know, inventory information? So trying to really get at the core of what is that data that you wanna be protecting. The next piece is where is that data stored? Um, from both a physical and a logical perspective. Um, so logical meaning, you know, which applications, which systems, um, and then where are those systems located? Um, is it a franchisor responsibility or the responsibility of the franchisee? Um, so those are key questions to ask. And in some cases, uh, you may have your systems in the cloud. Um, you may have outsourced it to a third-party data center, for example, a co-location facility, managed service provider. So thinking about who may be responsible for those systems. The next step is to identify the actual risk to those systems and data. So thinking about things like unauthorized access, malware, ransomware, um, environmental events or, or natural disasters um, that may impact availability of the systems, um, point of sale systems being unavailable um, would be a key risk in this industry. Um, so identifying what those risks are and then trying to map out what their likelihood and impact is. So what is the likelihood that they're going to occur? Is it you know, a large likelihood or is it something that seldom occurs? Um, and then if it does occur, what's the impact? Is it gonna have a high significant impact that may be detrimental to your organization? Or is the impact gonna be more of a minor significance and something that may be more of an inconvenience? Um, once you get this information, it will help you figure out what level of controls you need to have in place um, and how significant those risks are to your organization. So. Mapping the controls you have in place for each of those risk areas is also a very important component. Um, wanting to define who that responsible party is, like I mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, identifying those controls helps you to figure out um, where the holes are. So once you've identified the risks, um, are you able to protect yourself against those risks? And one thing that we always want to remember is you can never mitigate 100% of risk. So there's always going to be some level of risk that still remains. And there's different methods for addressing that risk. So some of it's going to be delegated to a third party. Um, some of it may be um, addressed via a cyber insurance policy, for example. Um, some of it you may accept. You say, we've got enough controls in place and there really isn't anything more that we can do in that area. So again, kind of the final question is going through once you've done that risk assessment and asking your organization, are we comfortable with what our residual risk level is in each area? We often yeah, this is. Yep, oh, sorry. 
this is another area where when you're doing that risk assessment too, organizations can really, you know, leverage whether it's the franchisor or the franchisee's responsibility uh, in that, in mitigating some of those risks as well. Right. And when Scott and I are working with organizations, we typically kind of always go back to the risk assessment as the first step. So whenever you're trying to figure out um, strategic action items and, and what you want to put your focus and efforts on, we always go back to, have you done a risk assessment so that you can identify what's important to your organization? So this is always a good first place to start. As far as um, our first polling question, I uh, just wanted to get a sense of those, those in uh, the webinar today. Um, when was the last time your company performed a risk assessment? Uh, select one within the last month, within the last year, over a year, or uh, we've never performed a risk assessment. You know, one thing that, Sarah, we've seen over the last year, year and a half as, as we've gone through the pandemic is that organizations have really looked at their risk assessment and, and understood that you know they are the way that they do business has changed, whether it's the back office or even the front of the office. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've seen that quite a bit, and depending on you know your favorite places to go, have changed just how you know, whether um, you can go and, and sit down at, at the location, or it's just carry out only, or you know depending on the services that you provide as a franchise. Um, you, know, you may have to, to change those those processes around, which really stems in that area of, of looking at your organization's processes and thinking through where are the risks now that we're coming out of uh, the pandemic. Yeah, that's a good point. And um, I'm looking at the polling results here, and I honestly, they are too small for me to see, but it looks like a majority of you have performed a risk assessment within the last year. And it looks like, um, when I say majority, it looks like it may be about 35%. Um, and then um, most of you over a year ago um, would be kind of our second answer here. And then that's one, um, you know, point that we didn't make when we were talking about the risk assessment and Scott brings up a good point. The pandemic has, um, I think, allowed a lot of organizations to go in and place another focus on that risk assessment, um, but it is a dynamic document and it is something that should be looked at on a regular basis, um, regardless of, you know, a natural disaster, pandemic, any sort of significant event. We typically tell our clients, depending on, you um, what level of risk typically exists in your industry? If you are in a higher risk area or have a lot of sensitive data or have identified a lot of higher level risks, um, doing something at least every year, if not more often. Um, sometimes we have organizations that go through some sort of exercise every quarter. Um, to look at risk assessment really makes a lot of sense because it, it's not meant to be static. It is meant to be dynamic and to continuously evolve based on the changing times in your organization. Sarah, it looks like your screen kind of hiccuped again. Okie doke. Give me one second, folks, and I am going to change that again. Apologize. Yeah, based on the numbers, it looks like well over 50% of you have done a risk assessment, um, whether it was in the last year or within the last month, but certainly, um, you know, over 75% of you, in fact, it looks like maybe even closer to 80%, at least have done one, um, you know, whether it was just a little over a year ago or, or within the last year. So, um, you know, certainly happy to see those numbers uh, as high as they are. Perfect. So we're going to switch gears a little bit and um, focus on incident response plan. Um, so a formal incident response plan that's been reviewed and tested uh, will help to ensure that everyone understands their responsibilities in the event of an incident. Like Scott said at the beginning, uh, typically we like to say it's not if something's going to happen, it's when something's going to happen. Um, everybody is a target, particularly in industries where you have large amounts of um, customer um, or financial information. So the first step is to just have a plan. Um, so um, that requires preparation in terms of trying to figure out who the folks should be that are involved, um, what are the steps that you're going to take. And then the second piece when we're looking at detection is 
how do people know when an event has occurred? Um, so do they know who to communicate to? And, and that responsibility really lies with both IT and non-IT employees, um, although they do have different roles. So individuals that are on the front lines um, in your stores and your locations um, have a role, as well as those in the back office area looking at um, you know, folks in the accounting um, department, folks, um, you know, in the IT department, everybody does have a role and that role is a little bit different. So we want to think about um, what those communication um, levels look like at each of those uh, significant roles. And, and from an IT perspective, what you want to look at is, is there sufficient monitoring in place for the IT department to know when an event has occurred? Um, do you have a SIEM in place? Are you performing um, network monitoring, you know, firewall IDS, IPS? Is there something that can alert you when something has happened? And then have employees been trained on how to identify an event or incident? So again, those frontline employees, accounting, any other folks, um, security awareness tr training, it really is what's key here. And this is how we typically see folks getting that information that they need um, to identify when some sort of event may or may not have happened and who they need to communicate that to. And then from an analysis perspective, uh, what when does an event get elevated to the level of an incident? Because events happen all the time. Some of them may be of lower level significance, some may be higher level significance that would escalate into something that you would classify as an incident. So that would be, you know, perhaps a breach or some sort of leak of um, confidential sensitive data. And then does IT have the right resources to analyze the event and incident? Or do you think you might need third party support? Um, and, and if you do think that you're going to need some sort of support to help you in this analysis phase, have you compiled a list of third parties um, that you've already vetted? So in the event of an emergency, you can quickly call them um, to get on board and start that analysis phase. And Sarah, what we've seen, especially in, in, our, in the forensic side, when we help our clients is that um, those organizations that have pre-established relationships with forensic companies really can get ahead of uh, the game as, or the curve as far as knowing where that incident or event uh, started from. Um, and then it also helps as you it, when you get an established relationship to start start thinking about what is the or what are those data sources that you may need to collect uh, so that you have the right retention going. Uh, you know, in particular firewall logs or, or other logs that, that you may need to retain in order to identify where those um, you know, incidents started and, and where maybe the total overall impact it, uh, put to the organization's at. Yep, yeah, that's a good point. Um, containment is an important step, so you do need to know how to contain the incident. Again, that could be something you're doing internally or with those um, third-party forensics folks. Um, you also need to know how to remove the bad actors and what they've left behind. So eradication is a very, very important phase in this. And then what steps are important for recovery? So do you have sufficient backups of the system? Are you able to recover once you have gone through all the other phases in your incident response plan? And most important um, is lessons learned in communication. So we recommend that you test your plan at least annually and do a debrief afterwards. Um, after you've you know, done a test of the plan and after any major incident to identify areas that worked well um, and areas that you might decide you need to do things a little bit differently. And then you wanna update the plan accordingly. And again, communicate, communicate, communicate. So if you have changed any portion of the plan, making sure that you're letting those um, involved know that there have been changes um, so that they can quickly get themselves up to speed in the event another incident happens. And this is also when, when you think about incident response plans where you really are tied together with that business continuity plan. I'm, I'm just reminded of that recent um, you know, disruption of service in, in the time software Kronos. And there was a number of organizations that weren't able to process payroll. They weren't able to process mm -hmm. their, their time for employees. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things where from an incident response, it wasn't necessarily the organizations that were using the, the software. Um, but if, if you have really good vendor relationships as well as kind of planning in, in place, that business continuity plan would really kick in and have some availability of what can you do in order to, you know, continue to process payroll in that example. So um, just shifting gears a little bit, you know, as, as we mentioned, as you go through your risk assessments, or mentioned that 
you know, you really do want to focus on where your controls are in order to mitigate those risks. Um, you know, from a franchise and franchisor perspective, one of the control frameworks that you could implement or if you've already implemented is in the area of PCI compliance or the payment card industry. Um, it's got, they have really good um, controls in order to maintain that data security, data privacy, especially around your customer information. And if you apply those same controls uh, against your employee data and, and other financial data as well. Um, oftentimes you get a, you know, three, four, or, you know, um, you get two birds with one stone or three birds with one stone in that instance. Um, and so just looking at some of the things that, you know, from a PCI perspective, uh, what we know today is that PCI 4.0 has been released. And so if you weren't aware, we were kind of awaiting this for the last probably two years and certainly you know, through COVID, uh, that that was delayed. Um, but they also took their time in just getting some really good responses back from the, the industry, uh, as well as from a, a number of the assessors, assessor firms as well. Um, just a reminder that PCI, again, is the payment card industry and data security standard. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty lengthy framework. It's got uh, six goals. They really didn't change any of the goals and they didn't change any of the 12 requirements that are included in those goals. Um, but you're still, you know, it's still kind of looking at building and maintaining secure networks, protecting that, that cardholder data, uh, implementing strong access controls in place, and then ultimately monitoring and maintaining a strong information security program. Um, when you get down to that, that the sixth goal, you're really looking at policies and procedures. And those are the ones that uh, you can really take and you know, leverage from not just protecting cardholder data, but also your your overall organization as well. So when uh, when they went to update the the PCI standards, um, the council who who is ultimately responsible for uh, issuing the the requirements wanted to continue and just have goals for what the PCI 4.0 was going to look like, um, you know, continue to promote good security, make sure that they, uh, you know, the control still protected the, the payment industry and, and overall from a credit card and customer perspective. Um, but I think some of the things that they also wanted to do was to have some flexibility and enhance the validation methods. And, and these are some areas that as an industry, when we think about um, you know, sometimes compliance can get very cumbersome. Uh, I think that PCI was uh, faulted a little bit for that, where it, you, know, you just had to do it because it said so in the requirements. Um, in, in this newer version, there's a lot more flexibility and just kind of uh, meeting the organization where, where you're at uh, from a requirements perspective. Uh, the overall timeline for implementation for the, the new uh, requirements, um, currently you're still good at, at looking at the current uh, DSS, which is 3.2.1, um, and that will really uh, phase out as of March of 2024. Um, so you've got uh, between now and, and then to be able to look at the framework, look at the different requirements, and start putting a game plan together for addressing some of these controls. Um, any, any assessment after uh, the 31st of, of March in 2024 then would shift over to the new uh, DSS requirements. Um, and then all the new future data controls that are in, in the 4.0 will then have to be effective uh, in, in one more year. So you've got a whole other year after that even to be able to put in uh, some of the newer controls that they're um, you know, requiring for um, for uh, 4.0 as well. So March 2025, uh, from there on out, then it would it would be uh, your responsibility to maintain those those newer controls. And even though that seems like a long time frame, it can happen quickly, and it's always important to start early and understanding what those new 4.0 requirements are, um, so that you can get everything that you need to um, in place before it kind of gets um, into that 13th hour there in 2024. Yeah, surprisingly, 2022 is almost halfway over already. Sarah. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Crazy. Um, so just some things to look out for, you know, as I mentioned in, in the new DSS, they're, they're really kind of 
pushing that that area of flexibility. Uh, they want you to have the option to be able to do maybe something that in the past you would have considered it a compensating control or a control that really was higher than what they were recommending, but then you had to put in you know, secondary control anyways to meet the requirements. Um, and so that some of the things that they're uh, really, you know, uh, encouraging organizations to do is to go ahead and leverage your current control framework, um, really focus in on those, those areas of risk that you've already identified and then have controls in place for. Um, you know, sometimes we see that, especially if it's, you know, in the area of virtualization or uh, remote connectivity. Uh, so if you've got better controls in place, there's there's no need to go ahead and put something uh, in you know new control in place just to meet the requirements uh, going forward. Um, the other big one is is requiring multi-factor authentication. Uh, so this is where um, you have to have both a user ID and a password, uh, as well as a secondary form of authentication. So, uh, for example, you know if you're using an iPhone, um, face recognition. That would be a second factor. A thumbprint would be a second factor. Uh, oftentimes, we see this really in a token, uh, whether it's a hard token where you get a six-digit code or a soft token, uh, meaning that it's uh, a, a code that either gets texted to you or it's part of a small app that's on your phone. Um, and so a user would have to put their user ID, their current password, plus this other uh, token value to be able to authenticate into uh, what's considered the cardholder data environment. Um, so the cardholder data environment, just as a reminder, is it's the environment where you're processing, storing, or transmitting card cardholder data. So uh, depending on how your you know, your franchise or franchisee um, locations are are set up, that might mean just the front of the office, the, the stores, or uh, maybe it also might include your back office, your accounting departments, and those kinds of things. Um, one thing we did see is just an increase in, in the overall security by looking at uh, passwords. Um, the industry for a long time um, was criticized on having such a low uh, password number, so or password um, requirement. It, it right now and, and currently it's set to seven characters, and and that seems very um, very low, in, you know, compared to things that we've seen uh, from what NIST has put out and other other uh, compliance frameworks. Um, a lot of times the seven characters though were, were based on some of the legacy systems that are out there from a payment application. Um, in the new version in 4.0, the password requirement is gonna elevate from seven to 12 characters. Uh, you, there is a caveat though. Um, and so you have to have 12 characters with 90 day uh, expiry if you don't already have MSA uh, enabled in that on that system. So just uh, you know, think about those systems that if you can put MFA on, uh, you don't need to increase you know all the way up to 12 characters, but somewhere hopefully you're uh, you know from an overall security perspective sitting at somewhere between 10 and 12 anyways. But uh, that's just something to to look into. Um, the other area area uh, to look out for is um, just the definition or being a little bit more defined. Uh, in, the, in when they talk about a control that is, is set to be periodic. Um, right now, there's a couple of those terminologies within the requirements where periodically check uh, and inspect a point of interface or the, the actual little uh, credit card terminals or periodically check uh, wireless access points, those kinds of things. Um, they're really going to focus in on uh, making sure that aligns with your risk assessment. So if you define that periodic to be on a quarterly basis uh, or monthly basis, then part of your assessment then would be uh, to verify and validate that against your risk analysis. Um, the last one there, uh, they, they are seeing obviously an increase uh, like we all are in the area of phishing. Um, and so they wanna be able to really uh, enforce some of that uh, good security around phishing. Um, and so they want to have both uh, an assessment that occurs uh, for organizations that should be PCI compliant, as well as having um, training that occurs. And so that's something that you'll need to uh, look into as well, um, whether that's on a quarterly basis or 
you know, some, some organizations now are doing it monthly uh, where you simulate a fishing attack and then also have annual training related to, um, to the fishing as well. Next question. Um, part of part of the uh, the new requirements, as we mentioned, is really in the area of um, just how are you going to assess the your your new requirements. Um, so one of the one of the things that that the PTI was criticized for was um, you know not being flexible in in its approach to be able to test some of the things that they wanted from a risk perspective. Um, and so one, the new approach will allow organizations to really validate based on the risks and controls that you have in place. And so you'll work with your assessor to be able to come up with those tests um, themselves in a customized approach. Uh, there also will continue to be just a regular defined approach where you'll have um, you know, the typical uh, assessment based on the requirements as well as the, the prescribed uh, testing that, that can occur, um, you know, for, for organizations there as well. And that takes us to our next polling question. So one of the things that we would like to know is how confident are you that your organization meets PCI compliance? Are you very confident? A little bit confident, not quite sure, or absolutely not confident at all? So one, of one of the things, things is, go ahead. oh yeah, go ahead, Sarah. Sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, one of the um, things that that the PCI didn't do, which is kind of nice, is they didn't change the requirement um, documents, the actual self-assessment. So those you'll still see as being familiar. So if you were doing an SAQA or an SAQC, they didn't change some of those requirements. You'll just need to work with your uh, assessing firm to be able to identify if that's still relevant to you, uh, and then from there determine which which validation method you want to uh, go with, whether it's a customized approach or just a standard approach. Um, the the other uh, piece of, to that is also just looking at your overall um, you know, scope and, and making sure that you've got the right assessment, uh, and, and that's something that you can work with your assessor with as well. So it looks like from a response standpoint, um, a majority of you are unsure whether your organization meets those PCI compliance requirements um, with the second, uh, second response being just a little bit confident. So, you know, I think it, it probably makes sense, um, you know, to do a little bit more research, um, you know, on PCI um, and to determine whether or not your organization um, has a requirement to meet that. And I know, Scott, that a lot of times we'll go into organizations and do what we call PCI discovery and responsibility um, assessments where we help organizations figure out, you know, first and foremost, are they subject to PCI compliance requirements? Um, and then if they are, help them figure out where resp responsibility lies for each of the areas. Yeah, and that's um, something that I know as, as both a franchisor and a franchisee, there, sometimes there's a little bit of confusion related to who's, you know, whose technology is this really and who's responsible for um, the overall compliance piece. And, and really, if you think about it, if you go back to the overall risk assessment, um, you know, if, you're, if you've identified an area of risk for your organization, regardless of um, you know, where that technology sits or who's, who's um, you know, responsible at the maintenance level, let's say, if it's a risk to the organization, that might be just something, you know, as, as you consider the control that you have to put in place, um, still looking at address, you know, identifying what that control is, implementing it, and then uh, going and working with either side to be able to make sure that, um, you know, whether it's the franchisee's responsibility or the franchisor's responsibility mm -hmm. for, let's say, patching or maintain, you know, maintenance or setting up um, secure networks and those kinds of things. You know, one of the things that we saw um, it was a couple of years back is 
you know, when the Jimmy John's uh, data breach occurred, a lot of the franchise ease, you know, felt like they, they weren't really responsible for that, that bre overall breach. But, um, you know, some of it, there was a little bit of uh, kind of shared responsibility uh, in, in making sure that that, uh, those systems were up to date and certainly um, you know, on the franchise or side, making sure that the, the, um, you know, the overall network was protected as well. But there's a little bit of both and, and certainly can, you can see where there can be some confusion as well as some shared overall shared responsibility in, in updating your control environment um, for uh, protecting, you know, against a data breach or a cyber event that might occur. Right. So that takes us to uh, the end of the presentation. Uh, we wanted to leave some time for any questions um, that you all attending might have for us related to risk assessment, um, incident response planning, PCI, or um, any other cyber topic. So one of the questions, and I'll read this off, um, is I hope that software doesn't keep credit card data these days. It is easy to use tokens and have the credit card companies store all the credit card data. The best way to be PCI compliant is to not do anything that requires PCI compliance. Um, so Scott, I think I will let you address that one. Um, I think we certainly agree, but I think oftentimes um, PCI kind of shows up in ways we don't expect, um, you know, in terms of folks giving us their credit card information. Yeah, it's un, it's one of those where areas where if if you take a credit card or you process a credit card, um, even though it may be tokenized at the end or you don't store information, there still may be other parts of the PCI requirements that are relevant to the organization. Uh, in particular, a lot of the policies and procedures. So in that um, in that last. Uh, goal, you know, that we looked at, which was maintaining a strong information security program. Uh, a lot of those requirements will still be part of an assessment. But to the to the point of the question, th there may be a lot of things that aren't applicable in that an organization wouldn't have to do because they don't store credit card information. Um, and that really does go to that concept that if you, you know, the, before you start your assessment, make sure that you understand what that overall scope looks like um, as far as the risk assessment and then looking at um, you know, which systems, which people, and which processes are really included in that, that compliance assessment itself. It's yep. a great question. Scott, we have another really good question related to PCI. Um, so in a physical retail location, if a Wi-Fi router from the internet provider is PCI compliant, and that router is connected to a point of sale system that is also PCI compliant, I realize this is not comprehensive of what is required to comply with full PCI compliance, but despite this, notwithstanding a physical hack on the site of the devices, how would you rate the security level of data transferred via Wi-Fi and any devices utilizing the Wi-Fi on a scale of one to 10? So Wi-Fi is, is really is only as good as its implementation. Um, and so a lot of times what we see is that uh, you could create a clone uh, of that same Wi-Fi and then have a hacker reroute the Wi-Fi traffic to the bad actor's PC um, or pass it through the bad actor's PC and then back to maybe the point of sale itself. Um, so there, there's certainly still some risk elements there. Um, I would, I would have to think about what, what the advertisement of a compliant PCI router or PCI wireless um, looks like because I, I'm not familiar with that and I've not seen that type of language for an implementation. Um, for a wireless solution. Um, you know, typically when we see uh, implementations that are PCI compliant, they're more at the service level. Um, and then perhaps they have ability to assist in becoming PCI compliant. So maybe that wireless router um, allows you to, you know, at least do some scanning of other networks uh, within the organization. So maybe that's part of how they're advertising that they may be, um, you know, assisting in the overall wireless compliance part of the PCI requirements. But, 
certainly a lot of risk there uh, still uh, if you if you are using wireless within your payment processing or or your transmission of uh, credit card information. So the next question is who should do the risk assessment, the franchisee or the franchisor? Um, and I can take this one. So um, ultimately both. So ultimately um, each side of the organization is gonna play a role in the risk assessment, um, but likely it's going to be driven by the franchise organization itself. Um, and then um, them taking a role in identifying which areas they are going to delegate down to um, the individual franchisees. Looks like this might be the last question here. Um, how often should we test our incident response plan and should we include vendors in our testing? I can take this one too, Scott. Um, so we typically recommend testing the incident response plan at least on an annual basis. Um, and yes, to a degree, you should include vendors in testing um, from the perspective of making sure that the plan activates as you expected it to. Um, that you're able to have the right communication with those vendors and those vendors are able to support you the way that you anticipate them being able to support you. Um, I think that's the key piece of making sure that whomever you expect to have certain responsibilities in the plan, that they have the means to perform those responsibilities. Oh, looks like we have one other question that just came in. How much can you trust Microsoft Azure or AWS to have good security? And um, that's a good question, but one that Scott and I will likely refrain from answering. Um, you know, I do think that um, one thing to consider in that question is if those are um, you know, two of the vendors that you may be using to provide your services, uh, we would highly recommend looking at their SOC reports. Um, so they will have SOC reports themselves um, that go through and talk about um, their controls, not just from a PCI perspective, because PCI is kind of outside that, but from an overall um, cyber and internal control perspective. So that would be a good way for you to understand um, what level of controls they have in place and whether those have been able to be tested successfully um, by an external um, third party assessor. And to add to that too is that a lot of times, even though Microsoft um, or you know other vendors create uh, you know, these platforms, whether it's even VMware um, you know, that that you can leverage in the cloud, the organization is still responsible for making sure it, it meets their your security requirements. Um, perfect example is in the area of Office 365 and um, leveraging the, the webmail. Uh, if you don't configure the webmail properly, uh, which might include adding multi-factor authentication to your users, uh, that environment can be very risky and can have a lot of um, potential for bad actors to be able to uh, gain access to your, your employee's email. And we've seen that quite a bit. It's nothing that, um, you know, from a configuration standpoint, it's, kind of comes out of the box, but it's up to the organization then to enhance the security based on what your requirements are. And we have an additional question asking, what is a SOC report? Um, the, so the SOC report is what I mentioned in response to the last question. Um, SOC stands for Service Organizational Control Reports, which may or may not mean much to you, but in, in what it really is, is um, essentially it, it's looking at the controls that an organization has related to information security. So um, typically what we see in this industry, and as we are looking at organizations like Azure or AWS, they're going to have what you call an SOC2 report. And so that means um, it would be controls related to security of those systems, availability of those systems, um, confidentiality could be incorporated in that, um, where it looks at controls um, such as how are you authenticating users to the system? How are you making sure that only the right users have access? How are you um, performing detection mechanisms to make sure that um, you identify events or incidents? Um, what are the change management procedures? So if they're changing those systems, Azure, AWS, um, systems themselves, infrastructure surrounding the systems, do they have the appropriate change management controls in place to make sure that 
um, changes aren't being made in an unauthorized fashion. So um, essentially what that report is, it's a report done by a third party independent auditor that comes in and looks at an Azure or an AWS to test those controls um, to make sure that they are working the way that AWS and Azure attended them to. So if you have um, a, you know, an agreement or relationship with these organizations, um, you should have the ability as an existing customer um, to be able to see what those reports um, are and to take a look at them. And that's something that would be important in your vendor management process. We have an additional question. What are the best practices for accepting franchise applications with sensitive information like social security number? Not via email, Sarah. <laughs> yeah. This is one thing that I've seen um, organizations really start thinking about, especially whether it's uh, personal information or even, uh, you know, we see a lot of phishing emails that, that come across with mm -hmm. payment information uh, request changes. And, and these are really uh, very dangerous ways to, or, um, you know, to accept those changes. And so, you know, the, the more you can, um, push that process into a portal uh, where you where a user or organization has to log in with some credentials and then request um, you know whether it's a change address change of information or submission of, of um, you know tax information or other uh, PII um, using a portal is really the a better way to uh, you know facilitate that transfer of, of documentation um, that said, there's still some things within the portal that you'll need to do and just make sure that you, you, know, you don't allow malware and those kinds of things to be able to be uploaded, um, but much safer than just sending an email request or allowing an email request to be able to, to really affect those types of changes. And, and organizations that, um, you know, if, if a portal isn't available, then one of the other areas then is if you have to rely on email uh, maybe using a secure email, um, you know, where it, it must be encrypted in order for that submission to occur, but then certainly making sure that you follow up with a, you know, actual phone call where you're talking to somebody live over the phone to verify and validate that that request occurred. Um, recently, we, we had heard of, uh, you know, an organization where uh, an individual was trying to change their uh, payroll information they couldn't get into the portal, so then they emailed the IT person to, or their HR IT person to update that information. They didn't end up verifying and validating with the individual. And, and over the course of a month, uh, that individual didn't get paid, um, but you know, ultimately the, the payroll was still processed, it just didn't get put into the correct um, individual's account. And that, that ultimately was a loss then to the organization because they weren't verifying and validating that information with, uh, with the individual that had requested, quote unquote, requested that, that change. Mm -hmm. Good answer, Scott. I believe that is the last of the questions that we have. Um, thank you very much for letting us present to you today. Um, if you have any questions after the fact, um, please feel free to reach out and we'll do our best to, to help you out. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah and Scott. This is excellent content and excellent feedback from all of you. We really do appreciate it. Again, this webinar was recorded and along with the presentation deck will appear on our website early this evening. You'll be able to find that at community.franchise.org. Thank you again to Sarah, Scott, and the rest of the Plant Moran team. And again, thank you to everyone for tuning in. Have a great rest of your day and stay safe and healthy. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.